The following interview was conducted with Jody Borland, Director of Bioengineering Research for the, at the uh, Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, June 30th, 2009 at his residence in West Lafayette. Welcome and good afternoon, Dr. Good afternoon. Borland. Okay. Just tell us a little about where you were born and your parents in early years. I was born in Kermit, Texas, Winkler County, which is right at the corner of Texas where the west leg goes out to El Paso and the north leg goes up to the panhandle of Texas uh, to A.R. Bourne, Jack Bourne as he was known, and my mother's name was Marguerite. Lived there until I was about two and a half years old, then moved to a little community in the panhandle of Texas called Sunray. Lived there for a couple of years, moved to Pampa, Texas, began elementary school there, and about six months into the first grade, we moved to a little community in Grant County, Kansas, near the town of Ulysses. Went through elementary school through the third grade, then moved back to Pampa in the panhandle of Texas, and remained there through high school went to Rice University in Houston for my engineering education. After I graduated from engineering school, I briefly went into um, industry for a company named Acoustron. I had worked with Dr. Geddes from the summer of my sophomore year at Rice which I think would be about 1962, worked summers with Dr. Geddes in a uh, training program that he and Dr. Hoff had at Baylor College of Medicine, which really was biomedical engineering before there was biomedical engineering. This was a program that they designed to bring practicing physicians and engineers interested in medical problems into the physiology laboratory so that they could learn to talk to one another. And so I worked with Dr. Geddes the summers uh, while at Rice teaching in that program. Okay. After I was in industry at Acoustron for a while, Dr. Geddes attracted me back. Uh, he had a quick reaction design team in the Department of Physiology at Baylor College of Medicine. And he brought me back there to head up that group. I got real interested in the problems themselves and the underlying physiology involved. Typical of Dr. Gass, he got me to go to graduate school where he was my major professor. Uh, and at, took, this was at Rice? This No, this was at Baylor. Oh, Baylor, okay. At, and I took my PhD in physiology with Dr. Gass as my major professor. Okay. When he was attracted to Purdue to establish the uh, Biomedical Engineering Center at Purdue, he asked Dr. Babs, Dr. Tacker, and me to come with him to uh, set up that research center in uh, what was later, that was while the Potter Building was, sure. was not yet constructed. Yeah. And uh, so initially we set up our laboratory and offices in the basement of electrical engineering in the northwestern wing of that. And then when Potter came online and was ready, we then moved into the Potter Engineering Center. Okay. I want to back, uh, go back a little bit to the high school. I understand that you um, won a special, uh, you were a participant in the National Science Fair. That in Indianapolis, correct. and uh, for the research, I thought you might make a comment on that. And you came to Indianapolis, and that's very nice. Yeah, that was that was really a, a neat. I had a wonderful high school chemi chemistry teacher, Mrs. Ledbetter, Elaine Ledbetter, and she was very active in the National Science Fair uh, Association. Had several students that went to the na that went to national. And I placed second at the... Uh, this was the National in Indianapolis? The, the, yeah, uh -huh. the, the National was held uh, 
in Indianapolis that year. Got to go to the time trials. <laughs> so it was right. that time of year. That's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was at the uh, way. It was wonderful. And uh, placed second. And, uh, and, and well, and, and Mrs. Lev. What was your What was your project? It was a project on electroluminescence. Uh, we the, the these uh, devices produce light uh, by mechanisms very similar to that that LEDs produce light, but were not very common at that time. And I, I learned from Mrs. Ledbetter that I lost first place by coin flip. <laughs> the fellow who won, uh, yeah. who won the Nationals uh, had a project on vortices. Anyhow, it was, it was really a, a fun thing to do. And, and got to go to the races. <laughs> and you went through the state, and as a result of that, and then you got accepted to the... Was there a regional thing, and then the next would be the next? Yeah, the way okay. the science fair was organized then, we uh -huh. first had, a, of course, a local competition. Sure. And the year before, I won that, but then didn't make it through the regional, which was held in Amarillo, Texas. Okay. But then my senior year, uh, I had done more work on the project, and so then got won the regional, and then went to nationals. Took my first airplane ride <laughs> oh, from Indianapolis. Was there anybody else from your school that, or you were the only one from your school that went? But there are others from this. Anybody else from Texas that? No, I was the sole, sole representative from the state. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you come? Did was your teacher able to come with you? Yes, she did. She and my parents drove. But oh, she, you came by car. No, oh. no, I flew with her, and there was a. Uh, uh, one of the other teachers, uh, Mr. Sykes, uh, and Mrs. Ledbetter, and I flew in a Lockheed Electra. <laughs> I remember those. <laughs> yeah, very different. <laughs> it was an interesting flight, and my first flight. Oh, that's nice. So that was Anything, uh, and when you were in, in college, were you in any activities at all during college? And did you live on campus? I lived on campus the first two years and then moved off. Okay. And, uh, no, pretty well dedicated myself to the engineering at Rice was a challenging <laughs> curriculum. What field of engineering was this? Electric? Electrical. 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 Okay. Okay. All right. Now we. Uh, no, it's no military. Did you? And didn't you serve in the military at all? I was uh, in in the uh, ROTC program for a couple of years, but didn't follow it through to the active. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Now we're at uh, Purdue, so tell us about the research team and the early days and the orientation. And first of all, orientation to Lafayette should be included too. Oh, this was, uh, it was delightful coming here. Uh, we had. Did you do a visit before you came or? Yes, we okay. came up in uh, October, as I recall, of 73. And looked at, you know, houses and sure. that kind of thing. And then uh, we, we, we actually moved here in August of 74, as I recall. Uh, very nice place to come and, you know, we had been in Houston before. And it, was, it was a bit of a culture shock to move from a big city to a small. Sure. But with the university here, it was, uh, it was very nice. We yeah. were, we came here with a, a commitment from the university for two years, and we, each of us, the four of us, made a commitment to the university for a minimum of two years, and uh, we're still here. <laughs> That's very interesting. Very nice. And then um, tell us a little bit about your research and how you got started. I mean, the t working as a team, because it, it was a team effort, pretty much. Indeed. Uh, the first major effort that we had was one that we had been working on while we were at, in Houston at Baylor College of Medicine, which was uh, a project in ventricular defibrillation. And actually we transferred uh, a grant that was in force at Baylor to Purdue when we came here. But that, uh, that effort I worked in for almost 10 years uh, here, both in the problems of fundamental research uh, that had to do with des designing the equipment to deliver the shocks, and uh, in the toxicology, toxicology 
on that, and Dr. Tacker was the main one in the group that led that effort, but we created some very powerful defibrillators, much more powerful than you would need for human use, so that we could intentionally damage subject's heart, so we could establish the threshold for damage. Sure, understand. So we built some research machines that were really big. Uh, matter of fact, by one measure, we built the largest defibrillator to my knowledge, that has ever been built. <laughs> like the big, uh, big blue of IBM or something. That's right. yeah, well, actually, we, we had uh, somehow our equipment acquired names. You know, we'd come in one morning and there would be a name. I think the graduate students would probably put on. Sure. But we had we had one defibrillator that actually was we built while at Baylor, that was called Big White, and Big White stored energy of up to. 5,000 joules, clinical defibrillator typically in those days would store up to 400 joules. And then while we were at Purdue, one of the early projects that we endeavored was uh, to build a much more powerful one than that. And the machine that we created there got named Joule, J-O-U-L-E, the, the unit of energy and physics. Mm -hmm. And Joule could store 45,000 joules of energy. And so we, we used that machine to, one, establish the appropriate dose as subjects get larger. And two, we used that machine to create degrees of damage so that we could assess what happens when you get too strong a shock. Sure, understand. So we spent about, and then uh, when we were here at Purdue for two or three years, after two or three years, uh, the issue of automatic implantable defibrillators uh, arose. As a matter of fact, that became a, a very leading concern in the scientific and medical community because of a conference that Dr. Tacker and Dr. Geddes hosted I think that was about 1976 uh, that um, that we got interested in the automatic implantable defibrillator research. Mm -hmm. okay. Where was your the, the labs were also in Potter? Is that where you're using the labs, the laboratories that you were working with? Were yeah, okay. yeah. A, a, the big defibrillator Jewel was actually constructed in the basement of electrical engineering. Uh, w one summer, uh, Dr. Marvin Hines and I, uh, Dr. Coates, who was the head of electrical engineering, was kind enough to lend us one of the labs uh, for the summer, and we did the major part of the construction mm -hmm. uh, in Double E. But then uh, Potter came online seventy six. I Somewhere think. Somewhere along, I think that sounds right. Yeah. And so then we moved into the laboratories on the second floor of Potter, and then the work, most of the work was done there. We also uh, did work over in the uh, junior surgical suite at the School of Veterinary Medicine. Oh, okay. And so right. when special, when we had the need for very large animal subjects, we would then take the equipment over there sure. and do the work uh, with the vet school. And you, got, you gave a lot of presentations and wrote quite a few articles, right? Oh, you bet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we... Uh, really took off. Yeah, it was, uh, it was an exciting year. There were, it turned out to be a much tougher problem, I think, than many people thought it was going to be uh, when we began the work. Sure. Um, but then Hill, it was Biomedical Center first, and then Hillenbrand, they changed the name in 85. Yeah, that came uh, about what because of the support that uh, Hillenbrand had given, or yeah, Bill Hillenbrand was on the board of trustees, and I think and the so year, was his father earlier, right? Well, was another relative. William Hillenbrand was the senior so, Hillenbrand. That's right. Okay. Gus was the junior, uh, but Bill Hillenbrand was the founder of. Hellenbrand Industries, whose headquarters are in Batesville, Indiana. And uh, this is before the FDA established 
the uh, Medical Devices Bureau Division. And so the regulation of medical instruments back then was kind of a hodgepodge. And as it turns out, the National Fire Association was in charge of regulations for electrical safety of hospital equipment. And there was big concern about electrical leakage to the patient, both in the operating room and also in the patient room. This was also about the time that Hill Rom, the division of Hill and Marion Industries, which is the world's largest manufacturer of hospital beds, right. was starting to use electric motors to save the nurses from having to crank up and down the patient. The electrical motors caused excessive leak to the frame and the patient to be in concert with the rules set up by the the fire. yeah the, by the fire association, and so they were about to put uh, Hillrom out of business with their new product, Doctor uh, Paul. Gosh, I'm blanking. I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. It's okay. You can fill it in when you get the transcript. Go ahead. <clears throat> put a piece of wood in his car and went down and lifted the electrical motors from frame mounting, put the wood underneath them, used uh, nylon screws to attach them, solved the leakage problem. And in part because of his gratitude to Dr. Stanley. Who Paul, was at Purdue? Yeah, was he a Purdue he, person? He, yeah, Dr. Stanley uh, was the, when, when we came here, he became the associate director under Dr. Geddes of the center. But Paul was instrumental in attracting Dr. Geddes to come. And uh, he was, in part because of his consultation with Bill Hellenbrand, uh, Helen Brand donated, I think it was a half a million dollars to Purdue to establish biomedical engineering at Purdue. And so it was on those seed funds from Helen Brand Industries that Dr. Geddes was able to attract Dr. Babs, Dr. Tacker, and me to come. So that was the source of the funds, oh, okay. the major source of the funds, okay. uh, in addition to the Showalter uh, okay. fellow, okay. professorship. But uh, it's an, a unique finding and discovery, just a something yeah, like that. Yeah, well, as it turned out, it was a very good invest. Just from a financial consideration, it was a very good investment. Um, yeah. um, Had there been were there ever any accidents reported before this came about? I mean, have there been any fires at all as a result? You know, wasn't it wasn't a, uh, an issue of fire? The electrical leakage was a problem of. Stimulating the heart. The heart was the okay. primary concern okay. in those days. And uh, as it turned out, I think there was, uh, in my opinion, it was an, an over-exaggerated problem. But nonetheless, people had to sure. know, confine it. Then how did this particular division for the medical devices, did that come in as a result of that uh, with the fire, or how did that come about? Well, I think the was, researchers might be, just as a comment... The, uh, the FDA had regulated drugs sure. for many years, and so it was sort of a natural bureaucratic uh, evolution for them to uh, enter into uh, the safety and efficacy of electrical equipment sure. as well as drugs. And so this Medical Devices Bureau, I think the legislation was passed in 76, Ted Kennedy was one of the primary sponsors. Okay. And so the Medical Devices Bureau was established. Thereafter, after a sort of a uh, grace period of a few years, while the agency classified electrical equipment. Which ones would fall under the classification? Yeah, uh, they not just electrical, but medical equipment. Sure. Uh, they set up categories of risk, basically. And by the way, Dr. Geddes and Dr. Tacker served on panels to help that activity. Uh, yeah. I have a question going back to before you came. Was there a lot, was there 
much of negotiation before your team came with with the team and, and the university? Most most of that, Doctor Geddes did. He okay. took the he took he, the heat. Yeah, he he had been uh, in discussions with Purdue. I don't know how long, okay. but a year or eighteen months sure. before he decided to come. Okay. Yeah. And were you a little surprised when it finally and you got invited? Then you had to give some thought to it, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It, uh, <laughs> you all had to give thought. <laughs> yeah. Well, in I, Texas warning. Yeah, right? I got my PhD in May or June, and we came in August, so I came. Practically straight out of my <laughs> PhD, but of course I had known Dr. Geddes for many sure, years. Sure, he'd been that, working with so, him, connected. Yeah, yeah, that's very nice. Um, you also were involved with the patents. Did you? Uh, something I read says you took care of those. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that was kind of interesting. Uh, we got in. I, I got involved in the patents primarily because of our activity in the automatic implantable defibrillator. But when we came to Purdue, uh, Dr. Geddes and I were still pursuing uh, a patent application for work that we had done at Baylor. And so after we came to Purdue, then that patent issued after, uh, I think it was about a year. Uh, let me back up and relay the history of how we got involved in the automatic implantable okay. defibrillator. Because that would flow into this. To the patent. And it, it then remind me to come back to yeah. automatic implantable defibrillator and patents because they, they're intimately tied. The first publications that I am aware of, uh, and there were two uh, that came out in 1970, uh, one was by Michelle Morawski, and the other was uh, Dr. Shooter. Uh, Dr. Shooter took his PhD at Purdue, but at the time he wrote this article proposing an implantable automatic defibrillator, uh, he was at the University of Missouri in Columbia. When those two articles appeared, I remember a meeting that we had in Dr. Geddes' office at Baylor, in the Department of Physiology at Baylor, and the question that Dr. Geddes proposed to the group, which as I recall included Dr. Tacker, uh, the fellow who headed up the mechanical side of the research team, uh, Arno Moore. This was at Baylor? At Baylor, and me. There may have been other people there, but those are the ones that I remember. And Dr. Geddes said, should we get into research that would lead to the automatic implantable defibrillator? And at that time, we decided not to. We identified three primary reasons for not engaging in the research at that time. And they were, one, and Catherine, now you're really making me have to go back and think. One, one we, we didn't have confidence that we could automatically diagnose the condition. So, you know, we were concerned about the state of electronics at, at, at that time and our knowledge for correctly diagnosing ventricular fibrillation, distinguishing that from other things that might interfere with the diagnosis, artifacts. So we were concerned about reliably diagnosing the problem because then you would shock a patient when they didn't need to be shocked, right. and that was of great concern. The second was that we really didn't feel like we understood how much dose would be required to be effective and the ability of the, uh, the state of the art of electronics at that time to be able to do that in a reasonable size. But the real killer and the third reason was we didn't know how to select the patients that would receive the device. Uh, there really weren't adequate criteria for patient selection. And so that was the one that, that in 1970 dissuaded us from entering into research in automatic implantable defibrillators. At the conference, I think in 1976, Leonard, Dr. Leonard Cobb 
from King County in Washington State presented a paper in which he identified patients who had had an episode of sudden death, as it was called then, but survived. And that was because at that time they had uh, emergency technicians in the Seattle area that had defibrillators with in the fire trucks and I'm not sure the police had them at that time but I think the fire department did so they got to patients that had this or you know out of hospital ventricular fibrillation quick enough to save them mm. so there was this developing population of survivors of sudden death and so now we had a way to identify who would be candidates for the new device and so at that time which is, now that I think back, I think it was 75, we decided to enter into the research. Okay. The first money that I brought, that I earned for Purdue with outside research was to uh, develop a system for reliably diagnosing ventricular fibrillation for the use in an automatic implantable defibrillator. And that research was sponsored by Dr. Norman Weldon, who at the time was the plant manager, manager of CTS Microelectronics out on Cumberland. Uh, Dr. Weldon gave Dr. Geddes and me a contract to develop an automatic system for detecting ventricular fibrillation. And by the way, that was that led to the first patent that was granted to the center for work done at Purdue. And the inventors uh, on that patent were Dr. Geddes, uh, an engineer at, uh, that worked for Dr. Weldon at CTS, Reese Terry, and myself. So when that patent was then in process, the group, Dr. Geddes, Dr. Babs, Dr. Tacker, ganged up on me and said, Joe, we're going to put you in charge of two uh, efforts in the center. One is you're going to head up the automatic implantable defibrillator program, and the other is you're going to be in charge of patents. <laughs> and so uh, that's the way I got... That's how I got it. Well, but that's the way the center worked, sure. and, and it was really you great. Were, so here's a good example of a really team that... Came and stayed and did wonderful. Oh, the guys I team. the guys I worked with were just terrific. Uh, I I mean we stayed together for so many years, but that's the way we worked. Uh, you know, each of us would have a primary responsibility for an it. The other guys would contribute, but ultimately the responsibility One has for to take that the shepherding to keep somebody it. has to be the leader of that particular aspect of the sure. research, and so that was what Dr. Tacker and Get us some Babs ganged up on me yeah. to do in that time frame was to head up let patents. Ask, yeah. um, let me ask you a question. So how did CTS? What sort of work? Uh, I'm thinking of the research. The, the for the research, the company does not exist anymore. Correct. CTS. But how did the, had they done some work with Purdue? Or because I used to live in Beaujardin apartments, so I knew where they were located. And I had heard of them. Uh, CTS stands originally stood for Chicago Telephone System, which was founded by Basil Turner. And CTS developed a technology that predated integrated circuits. It was, it was in those days known as a hybrid technology. And basically, they had a technology whereby they could put conductors on ceramic substrates that were very small and they could make resistors of various values sure. with those substrates. So uh, in that era, pacemakers, cardiac pacemakers were an example of the kind of product that would result, that could benefit from that miniaturization. Uh, as integrated circuits developed, then integrated circuits would get put on that substrate. Sure. So they were a major OEM 
for the pacemaker companies. Okay. Dr. Weldon, with his acute insight, saw that the next potential, a next potential product for CTS would be the 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 Wadaddy pacemaker, i.e., the implantable defibrillator. So very astute in looking oh, ahead. Yeah, he was incredibly had an incredible vision. Yeah, but uh, he actually CTS was the first grant that I got at Purdue yeah. from him. What was the funding? Were you using industry sources as well as, as government sources in, through the years? or it, cha it changes, of course. Right. Yeah. When we came to Purdue, the mission statement that we subscribed to was that we would work on medical research projects that had the potential to benefit society. So we were a very practically oriented research group. We did practical research. Uh, I lost track of the question. Um, there was support, support for the oh, research. Yeah. So a natural consequence, I mean, Purdue is not in the business of making medical devices. Right. So industry was a necessary partner. Sure. You know, we would do the fundamental research, but then the next step was to be able to turn that into a product. And so we very naturally then would follow a project from idea to proof of concept to reducing to practice. And so at any point in time, the center would have research typically from say NIH or NSF to do fundamental type research, but we would also have industrial contracts with a more mature project okay. as we were working and then occasionally we did get some philanthropy so, right. so we would have a mix of at any snapshot in time we would have a mix of basic research funding and applied right. research funding typically from industry right. and so you know I have a lot of friends that we worked with over the years in industry and, and it, it, it was also very good because in basic research, it's very easy to start down a path that's very interesting, but may not really fit in with the notion that this is going to be a practical endpoint. When you're working with industry, the individuals there really keep you focused. <laughs> so, I would say so. Right. So it was a wonderful environment. Sure. So you could do the basic research, but... We also had the discipline provided by the industrial collaborators to keep focused on actually getting the product into use. Um, where were your uh, people that helped the students? Did you have a lot of grad students that helped over oh, the years? Oh, indeed, indeed. Okay. And they came from primarily engineering or others? We had both, and that was, that was a, you know, a wonderful quality of the team that Dr. Geddes assembled. Basically, he and I were engineers, and Dr. Tacker and Dr. Babs were in the life sciences. So we had both interests. So it was pretty natural that, uh, you know, Charlie and Tack would have people coming out of the vet school or biology or one of the life sciences. And Dr. Geddes and I would have people coming from electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, industrial engineering. But, but all of us worked, you know, all of us... Because you each bring something different to the table. Oh, yeah. And, and so if you looked at a graduate committee, you know, typically Dr. Geddes and or I would be a member. But we would also either have TAC or Charlie or both. And, and you know, which, which of us were on the committees depended on the particular project at hand and on. where the expert and interest lie. Right, exactly. But what was your, uh, what about contacts with the uh, IU School of Medicine? To get to uh, Tack and Charlie had the most contact there. Uh, we, I, I participated in some physiology labs in the early years, but as the defibrillation research built, uh, we, <laughs> I got way too busy to be right. able to participate. That brings up, I was asking yeah. earlier, the, La the Lafayette Center for Medical Education, which is now known as IU School of Medicine at Lafayette, you have a little bit of involvement with not enough yeah. teaching. And, and certainly, uh, you know, new Dr. Wagner, uh, right. Lindsay Wagner, and 
you know, if if they had a, it was usually my interaction there would typically be somebody associated that pro that program would have a problem that they needed a consult on. Okay. And so I had very little teaching involvement in sure. that program, but we did have some of the students that were in the program would come over and do research with us. Right. So okay. had many of the, particularly the MD PhD candidates. Right. And so okay. I would help them in their research. I was on the committee of several of those people, and so yeah. worked with And them. that program still goes, from, you know, to two years, and uh, as somebody said, still down in the basement of, of Lynn Hall. <laughs> right. Yeah, Dr. Tacker was, you know, the yeah, one still, who, he still well, was. and he really, uh, he really worked very hard in those early days to help establish that program. Yeah. So my hat is off to Tack for helping um, bring that about. Moving a little bit on the Wellness School of Biomedical, it's interesting that that particular came about the name with the, uh, with the association you had the CTS with the father. Yeah. Well, we, we, Dr. Wellner. And how the program has grown over the years. Now it's a school. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, probably one of the, uh, the best things that I did for Purdue was work with Dr. Tacker to seduced Dr. Wadaka when he completed his uh, PhD at MIT mm -hmm. to come to Purdue. Uh, we, uh, we worked with, with uh, D Dean Swartz. Dick Swartz. <laughs> Dick Swartz, yeah. He was, uh, I, I think he was still in electrical engineering at that time. Although he may have already been the dean, but Dick called Tack and said, "Hey, I've got this really bright young candidate who's interested in coming to Purdue in electrical engineering. He's also interested in biomedical engineering. Would you guys meet with him?" And so Tack and I did. And George later told us it was the it was the thing that tipped him over to select Purdue over some other universities that he had prior, high priority. Sure. So that's probably the best thing I did for Purdue was to... Very good. And, and I'll tell you, it really took, in my opinion, a lot of courage on Dick Swartz's part to appoint George to be the head of the welding school. He was awfully young and junior to have such an important appointment. Dr. Swartz saw in him what we now know right, yeah. as his extraordinary abilities. And uh, my hat is off to Dr. Schwartz. For Let's go back that. to biomedical engineering, looking at it from Purdue. It's really grown. Is that, and it's been, was one of the early uh, leaders in biomedical engineering and weren't many programs in when you people came, were there? That is correct. There had been some biomedical engineering effort at Purdue prior to our arrival, but it had been scattered about the university and there was really no coordinated effort. And that's one of the things that I think we, we helped right. was to have a focused group on that particular activity. There were four centers established in that era and the only one that survived is biomedical engineering. Yeah. Uh, and it grew. Yeah, it grew and it grew. Right. Coming back to uh, you ask about the research we did. The first 10 years, a big act. I mean, we had lots of interesting projects, but ventricular fibrillation and then the creation of the automatic implantable defibrillator were important in that first 10 years or so. Then, in about the mid 80s, my major research effort uh, went from one of cardio, uh, cardiovascular problems to one that was more general and specifically related to neural problems uh, at the time, uh, I began, uh, became interested in uh, stimulation of tissues by magnetic fields. And, and that project arose out of an interest in stimulating the brain. And Dr. Tacker and I, and Dr. Geddes, of course, sure. worked in that area which ultimately led to our involvement in research that established the limits of gradient fields for 
magnetic resonant imaging. The MRI. The MRI work that we did. Uh, that lasted about 15 years right. <laughs> after yeah. that. That's very good. Um, what about some of the uh, awards and honors? How about that? I think that Medical Instrumentation Award is, is pretty good. And then speak about the Joe Borland Graduate Student Travel Award. One of the, the let me take the last, the, okay. the former was a, sure. for a paper, but let me, one of the things that we had, and, and I think we weren't alone as researchers, in the funding sources that we had, it was really kind of difficult to justify sending students to meetings, that we were always scrambling to find a source of funds to do that. I think that's a very valuable experience for a young person to be able to go to national meetings, experience having to field the questions that come out of the left field in the audience. And do, a pre and do some presentation, really participate. Do the presentation themselves, or even to go and just be a member of the audience to see it, there, there, there is a, a sense of scientific investigation that I think you can only get by being there. Right, exactly. And, and one of the things that we as a group found difficult was the funding for student travel. So when I retired, I thought one of the things that I could help Dr. Wadika and Purdue do was to establish a fund that would have that as a specific intent. That's very nice. And do they, uh, they can go, what, once a year, or does it, how does it work? They Put no fly. strings on that. That's okay. strictly up to the faculty of the Weldon School. So whatever whatever funds they have available or whatever students... It, I, the, whatever the application whatever is. Whatever the application is, right. is strictly up to the school. Right, okay. And then that medical instrumentation, because you certainly worked with instruments. <laughs> oh, indeed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All of us, you know, chaired many scientific sessions uh, AMI, the American Association of mm -hmm. Medical Instrumentation, was one of the early groups that really helped the field. And so we supported that by, one, sending papers and two, chairing sessions and, sure. and that kind of thing. And, and I think the award there was sort of an acknowledgement of, of that activity. Right. And then, uh, were there any other associate American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering you were involved in that, or were there any other associations? None that I. Okay. No, I, I, I got Catherine. I got the gratification from doing the work. Not there you go. That's okay. <laughs> what about family? Let's talk a little about that. Uh, you have, indicate you have a couple children. Did, well, let me let me start with my wife. Okay. Uh, my wife Barbara. Uh, I had mentioned the training program that I worked with with Dr. Geddes in the summers of. Uh, while I was in engineering school. One summer, uh, there was this young lady who sat in the front row in one of early morning lectures. She would sit in the front row and go to sleep during my lecture. I later learned uh, that a part of the reason she was going to sleep was because she had just entered her fellowship in pediatric cardiology. And so frequently she came to the lectures having spent all night taking care of very critically ill children. Uh, when we came to Purdue, one of the difficult decisions that Barbara had to make was whether or not to remain at a very prestigious practice of pediatric cardiology or follow me here to Purdue. And we decided to come here. It turned out to be a very good decision. She was able to uh, uh, establish a practice of pediatric cardiology here in this community. This community is not big enough by itself to support pediatric cardiology, so the community would not have had a local pedi pediatric cardiologist had we not come here. Sure. Uh, but she gave up that practice to come here turned out to be a wonderful thing. We have two children, so she was able to basically work part-time, but uh, this yeah. is a wonderful place to rear children. 
So it turned out to be very good. Fairly early at, in, after our arrival, uh, the local pediatricians decided to establish a neonatal intensive care unit. And so they designated Barbara to be the medical director of that. So she is the mother of neonatology in this community as well. And she recruited Dr. Chua, who is still the, uh, Lynette Chua, who is still the uh, director of that facility. But, so <clears throat> this was this was very good for the community and very good for the Borlands. <laughs> and the family, too, yes. as well. <laughs> so both of our children went to West Lafayette School. Okay. As it turns out, both of them got their undergraduate degrees at Rice. My son, Steve, then returned here and took his master's in electrical engineering at Purdue. And my daughter uh, took her PhD, graduated with an undergraduate degree at Rice, and then took her PhD at University of Louisville and is a pr practicing clinical psychologist. In Houston, in Texas? In Houston, in okay. Houston yeah. Let's talk about the post-Purdue activities. When did, when did you retire, Joe? I retired uh, June 30th, 2006. Okay. So what have we been doing since then? You know, people say, what are you going to do when you back down from that hyperactivity? Yes, everybody down when they're, you know. Uh, and I tell you, Catherine, I have not had enough time in the day to do all the things. Barbara and I, one of the things that Barbara and I discussed during our active professional lives sure. is that we would really like to travel for pleasure. And so, indeed, we, we do travel a bit. Is she do, still doing any uh, medical work at all? No, she or? retired in 1999. Oh, before you, okay. Yeah, she retired before I did. Uh, and we bought the home in Houston in 2004. I continued to uh, work in Weldon for a couple of years beyond that. And so she would... She and I, I had to be here in the spring to lecture, <laughs> and so we spent springs apart, but uh, it made the heart grow fonder. <laughs> right. Uh, do you have a, um, a Purdue tradition that comes to mind that you'd like to share with us? And I also ask for an outstanding event. Uh, you no, not really. Uh, well, how about an outstanding event, something that comes to mind? Well... You know, most most of my activities are focused on the road. I had some really unique experiences. And one of those was that I personally appeared before the Board of Appeal of the European Patent Office and defended a couple of patents that we had, which were later sold to Medtronic. Uh, in the mid-80s, I have been told that Purdue had more intellectual property income than any other university. And it was because of the sale of those patents. And so something that stands out as a unique event is my personal appearance before the panel so. of judges at the European Patent Office. Uh, that, that, was, that really stuck with me. I guess the other uh, is um, the activities that we had with General Electric in the MRI gradient safety research. I kind of got a, a, a different perspective on how to assess the quality and significance of research as a part of that activity. And by the way, Dr. John Ninehouse in electrical engineering was a key partner in these activities. Really enjoyed working with John, and he contributed greatly to the effort. But when, uh, and it's sort of timely now because of the Obama interest in taking over medical care in the U.S., we had a similar activity in the early 90s with the Clinton administration when Hillary Clinton 
was going to take over medical care. We were working with General Electric uh, MRI Medical Division at that time to establish gradient safety for fast scan MRI units. And in those early times, we were under contract support, our funding source was General Electric in the, in the activity. When it looked like the practice of medical medicine was, the funding for practice of medicine was going to dramatically change, hospitals just shut down purchase of capital equipment. When, when I would go up to GE to work in their research laboratories at the MRI Center, prior to the Clinton administration, we would have to go around their parking lot and typically park way out in the extreme uh, of the parking lot. So we had a long way to walk to get to the entrance. When the Clinton administration threatened medical practice, hospitals stopped buying equipment. GE laid off hundreds of engineers at the MRI Center. And so in the mid-90s, 92 through five or so, when we'd go up to Waukesha to the MRI Center, we could basically park at the front door because the parking lot was virtually empty. We did the fundamental research, and, and by the way, our funding from GE also dropped precipitously. As a matter of fact, we, Purdue, uh, GE was going to build a building at Purdue to give us uh, an MRI scanner. I had been working with Purdue architects, with General Electric siting engineers. We had the building plan, and so we were going to get an MRI scanner uh, at that time. But of course, when the, when, uh, the sale of magnetic resonance imagers went in the basement, GE canned that project. And our funding dropped off. So then Dr. Nyenhouse and I sought uh, uh, NIH funding. And as a matter of fact, it came through the cancer uh, division of that, uh, National Institutes of Cancer. We got funding to continue the research with a slightly different thrust. Uh, and more global. So that's how we were able to maintain the project. Did studies first in animals and then in human subjects. Uh, and um, the, that led to then our making personal appearance with the FDA. Got the FDA to reduce their criteria for scanners which permitted the introduction of the fast scanners. And by the way, it's one thing to get the FDA to ban something. It's quite a different and more difficult matter to get them to relax a standard. But we did that with the data that was accrued in Purdue Laboratories. And we appeared before the FDA panel in October I think 1995, they, the panel supported the reduction. GE showed their new products in November at NRSA in Chicago, and they started shipping product in January, I think of 96, that following year. We did some follow-up studies the, over the next couple of years, and we were back parking in the far extremes of the GE parking lot. So my model for assessing research is the parking lot model. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> oh, and I'll leave it up to you in closing as you look back or look ahead. Oh, I'll leave it to what you'd like to say, some final comments. Think about it. Purdue was a wonderful place to conduct research, a wonderful, supportive environment. 
Dr. Geddes was an extraordinarily talented, generous mentor, put his mark on many students, including me, made them be more than they would have ever thought they could be. I had tremendous colleagues to work with, had lots of fun, got a lot of gratification, a lot of effort, but it was a wonderful experience. Good. Thank you very much, Joe Boyle. This concludes it. Thank you very much.